Hello and welcome to today's show. So I decided to make complete plans and build videos for the Super Jig and information how to buy those plans you will find in the video description below. This is my own Super Jig, the one I showed you in the presentation for the Jig and this is the Jig that I will be building in this series. In the video description and in the link where you find the plans I will also give you an estimated material cost for this Jig. This became quite long in quite many video parts and I don't expect you to watch them all and then start building your jig. The plan is that you build according to the drawings and the plans and they should be very complete in this respect. And then if you need additional support in one area you watch the video for that part. If I should recommend some videos over the other ones to be more important I would say the backbone assembly, the control wheel and the final part where I give some extra hints and tips and check the calibration of the jig are the most important ones. If you are uncertain if you want to buy the plants and maybe you think you need to upgrade your entire shop just to be able to build a jig, I will start this part one by going through the machines and the tools that you need to build a jig and then you can decide after that. So what machines and tools do you need to build this jig? Well I would say the first one is a table saw. It's not absolutely necessary, you could survive well with a track saw as well. But if you intend to build this jig I think that you plan to use it on a table saw so I assume that you have one already. So let's head on to the next machine. You will need a router and you will need a circle jig that can cut quite small circles. I know that not all circle jigs can do that and uh, so when we come to this point in the bin I will show you some extra info about my circle jig. It's a great jig by the way. A uh, router table will simplify things. I wouldn't say that it's totally necessary but it will make life easier. And pretty much the same can be said about the next machine which is a drill press table. There is a lot of drilling involved in this jig build and the drill press will will simplify things although it's not totally necessary. You will need an M4 and an M5 thread tap and some Forstner bits. Here I have a 10, a 12, 15 or 16 and then a 32. The 32 is really important. Then you will need some router bits and the important one is one that matches the material thickness that we're using, in this case 15 millimeter. And then you will need some router bits depending on your clamping concept. The first concept and the one that I will be using is the micro rig dovetail clamps and if you choose that concept you need a dovetail router bit that matches the rail clamp. The second concept is routed in Festool rail clamps and if you use that concept you need a T-slot cutter that matches the rail clamps. And the third concept is routed in T-tracks that will match the Festool rail clamps and those can be routed in with pretty much any router bit. That's pretty much it for the tools that you need. I assume that you will have drill bits of standard sizes and so on, so I won't go through those. Instead, let's look at the parts that we need. If we look on the mechanical components you need to build this jig, I divided these into two categories. The ones on my right hand side I would refer to as critical, and here it's important that you, you use pretty much exactly the same components as I have used. And these will be fully specified in the plans, so you don't purchase the wrong components. So we have the linear rails, the linear bearings, the ball screw and the flange coupling. The one on my left hand side, here we have screws and knobs and mitre bar, digital readout and so on. This will be specified in the plans but not as detailed as these ones. And here it's not that critical that you use exactly the same components as I have used. So let's have a quick look on the main assembly drawing and uh, I will present the tactics for this build. And after that it's time to start. This is what the main assembly drawing looks like for this jig. As you see it's built up of several sub-assemblies. It's the bottom plate, the backbone as I call it, the note holder, the carriage, the control wheel and so on. Each of these sub-assemblies has its own set of detailed drawings. And I will build these one by one in a certain order and screw the jig together as we go along. When making more complex jig containing many parts like this one, I prefer to use a pure mechanical approach where I use cross dowels and threaded inserts together with machine screws to, to hold it together. It takes a bit longer time than just gluing the parts but it offers a few advantages. Uh, to start with, 
I can calibrate the jig quite late in the build. I can loosen the screws and slide the parts a little bit back and forth and so on to calibrate it. I can also disassemble and assemble the jig as many times as I want. And if needed in the future, I can replace components easily. So I will go for this mechanical approach and I will use some routed grooves in certain parts to, to guide the parts between each other. So I will start with cutting out all the parts that we need according to the cut list and then I will build the bottom plate sub-assembly. So let's start the build and I will start by cutting out the parts that I need using the cut list drawing and the cut list table with all the dimension. Uh, I'm using 15 mm Baltic birch for this build. Uh, I think it's a bit more stable material than MDF and it, can, it will survive a bit better in the shop. I also know that the Baltic birch is really hard to source these days and the price has gone up a few hundred percent. So you could also use 16 mm MDF and adjust the dimensions accordingly. But I will use 15 mm birch plywood and that's what the drawings are based on. The cut list layout that I have done is based on the Baltic birch dimensions uh, that I prefer to buy. It's 1525 by 1525 millimeter and I'm using a total of 650 millimeter of that entire sheet. Uh, you could of course use any layout that you want as long as you cut the parts according to the dimensions in the cut list table. The cut list drawing is divided into four major areas so I will start by rough cutting my piece of plywood into four pieces and then I will go ahead and cut to correct dimensions after that. After I rough cut my panel into four pieces I will take this to the table saw and cut to correct dimensions and I will start with the rip cuts and follow with the cross cuts. I'm done cutting up all my parts and uh, your puzzle should hopefully look similar to mine now. Here is the puzzle laid out according to the cut list layout drawing. Uh, I have marked all my parts with a number that corresponds to the numbers on the drawing and that is to easier keep track of them later on. Uh, you might see that some of my grain directions, especially for this part that would make up for the sides, differs from the drawing and that is because I changed the layout halfway through for an improved version. So this is the improved version and that is the one that will be included in the plans. Speaking of grains, one important grain direction I think is to have the bottom plate running in this direction because that would be the sliding direction later on when it's on the table saw. All parts are not cut to final dimensions yet, some will be trimmed later on but all this info is in the drawings as well. Speaking of accuracy and angles and so on, the one that you really should focus on is to get right angle corners on the bottom plate because this will be referenced later on. Except from this, there is nothing special here. So let's start the build. And my tactics for this is that I will show you the end result of each sub-assembly before we start building it. I think that gives you a better understanding where we are heading in the build. So in this part we build a bottom plate assembly and the end result of that should look something like this. Before starting the build I would like to motivate the decision to only have one miter bar on this jig. I have a push handle to operate the jig and that push handle is centrally placed over the miter bar. That means when I'm operating this jig I push it in a straight front to back motion and that motion is in line and centrally placed over the miter bar. I would say though that this method with only one miter bar is based on that you have some kind of mitre bar with expansion discs that you can tune for perfect fit. If you are used to having two and if you are not confident with having only one, just add another one on the other side. So let's start building this bottom plate assembly and except from the bottom plate we have the dust tunnel walls, we have the two pieces that will 
be glued together to make up for the front support and we have a thin plastic material that would be the dust tunnel roof. So I will start by gluing these two together and then I will lay out all the the hole positions and the, the routed grooves according to the detailed drawing. That is done, I will say a few words about the mitre bar, uh, both in terms of position and types of mitre bar and how to mount it. I think this is a super tool for laying out joints close to edges. It's really quick to work with. So I laid out all the grooves that I will be routing and I also laid out all the, the holes that I will be drilling. I also put a center line in the center of the width and uh, then it's time to determine where to place the, the mitre bar and here you have to measure on your saw the distance from the saw blade to the center of the mitre track. For the customer's saw uh, for which I'm building this jig it's 85 millimeter the, the center from the from the blade to the center of the mitre track. So I put the line here and then I mark the center of the mitre bar. For the front to back positioning of the mitre bar, the goal is to always have the expansion discs inside the top surface of the table saw. So this should never leave the mitre tracks if possible. For a short mitre bar like this with quite short distance between the outer discs, it never a problem. But this mitre bar is mainly for show, the customer will use his own. And if you have longer distance between the outer discs, they risk to leave the mitre track either in the front or in the back. And considering you have that problem, I would recommend that you center the mitre bar over the stroke of the jig. And I will try to explain what I mean with that. This thing here illustrates the front support and I will never start to cut in a position further back than this. And that is with the blade at its highest setting for this jig when the blade just passes the backside of the front support. And this thing here illustrates the, the carriage and this is the front of the carriage placed on the line. The dimension of that is in the plans as well. And I will never end the cut in a more forward position than when the carriage has passed the highest point of the saw blade and that is pretty much here. So the stroke of the jig is from here to here. Center the mitre bar on the stroke. I measure on this side how much I have in the backward position. That's about 20 millimeter. And in the forward position I have about 100 millimeters. So 20 in the back, 100 in the front. The difference between that is 80 millimeters. And to center the mitre bar on the stroke, we should off center it half of that dimension. That means 80 divided by 2, that is 40 millimeter. So in my case, with my table saw dimensions and my saw blade position, I should off center the mitre bar 40 millimeter forward. That would maximize my chance of having my expansion discs always inside the top surface of the table saw. This calculation you have to do on your own since it's depending on the, where the saw blade is located on the saw and the, also the dimensions of the saw and the dimensions of the mitre bar. I align the mitre bar holes with a laid out center line for it and then in the front to back position since I don't have this problem with the discs leaving the saw surface I just center it. And then I go ahead and mark my, my holes. I use a, a center marker for this. They look like this and come in different dimensions, but you could also use a drill bit with a with a tip on it. So then I go ahead and mark the holes through the mitre bar. I will go ahead and uh, transfer some of my routing lines over to over the edges, so I will see them on the router table, and then I will go ahead and drill all the holes. So all the holes are drilled, both front side and back side. Uh, so let's go ahead and route these grooves here on the router table. It's not super critical that we hit the lines perfect. You have some trim already later on, but we can do our best at least.
So that was the first groove cut here on the short side. And for the groove on the other side, I will be using the same edge against the fence. So that means I clamp my fence quite far away. And I will be running the same edge as a reference. And that means that your grooves on the outsides will be perfectly parallel, even if your bottom plate isn't perfectly square. So For the longer internal grooves, I made two lines on my router table fence where to start the cut and where to finish the cut. All my grooves are done, so it's time to put this bottom plate assembly together. I start with the dust tunnel walls. I also attach the front support. On the back side, here are no requirements on positioning. With the dust tunnel walls in, in position, I pre drilled the holes for the dust tunnel roof and screw that in place. The bottom plate assembly is almost done. I have attached the front support and the dust tunnel walls and dust tunnel roofs. I also rounded the corners and the edges so it won't cut you when you use the jig. The mitre bar is still not fastened and I would like to say a few words more about mounting the mitre bar. If your mitre track on the saw looks like this, a straight rectangular cut, I recommend that you mount the mitre bar in this uh, orientation so you have free access to the expansion disc from the bottom side of the jig. So the other alternative, if your mitre track on your saw looks like this with a T-shape, the expansion discs would risk end up in the T and that would not be, be very good. So if your saw looks like this, you will need to turn the mitre bar around so you have the expansion disc facing the jig. Uh, if you have it this way, you won't be able to reach the expansion discs from this side. So then you would need to drill access holes through the plywood to reach the expansion disc from the top side of the jig. Then clamp a big uh, square and I use the back surface of the jig as a reference. That's the same surface that was used for routing these grooves on the front surface. So by doing it this way I make sure that the mitre bar will be at the right angle to the backbone wall later on. So I clamped this in place and I aligned the mitre bar with a square and I flipped the piece and I tightened the mitre bar screws. One final word about the mitre bar and then we move on. Uh, you could of course route these very shallow grooves also for the mitre bar on the back side. And that means that you position it in a fixed position and you won't be able to change the angle and so on but it will be slightly better secured in its position. I prefer this way, uh, slightly oversized holes and then I can always adjust the position afterwards but uh, feel free to make the grooves for it if you prefer that method instead. Last thing that I would like to mention for the bottom plate is that you have to treat it in some way for it to slide easily on your table saw. I have used this simple furniture wax and waxed the entire bottom plate on mine and it slides very good on cast iron. You could also use this low friction tape and put some strips of that. You can either do it now or you do it when the jig is finished. With the bottom plate assembly fully done I think it's a good time for a break. So I will continue in part 2.